Thank you so much. Uh, people who've joined us live on Facebook, that was Silasha Razbhandari, the co-curator of the Triennale, giving us a little bit of a behind the scene with the pattern venue. So thank you so much, Shilasha, for covering for us. Uh, okay, so finally, I can uh, welcome you all to another iteration of KD 2077 online KD Kurakani conversations. Uh, as is evident, this program is also being broadcasted live on our Facebook page. We're really happy to have all of you here. I am Diti Sertin, a curatorial team member for the Triennale, and will be moderating this talk. In today's conversation, we've invited artist Dan Taula Papa McMullen, curator Sean Malone, and researcher Kumud Rana, who will be sharing with us their research, artistic, and curatorial practices to shed light on the intricate relationship between Indigenous and queer histories and practices. We are also very excited to announce that they will also be part of a publication edited by Cosmin Kostinas, the artistic director of the Triennale, and co-curators Silasha Razbhandari and Hitman Gurung. They've all been working really hard and relentlessly on this publication, so we are all very excited that this will be available to the readers soon. Uh, we are very grateful to have this opportunity to forge an interdisciplinary and transregional conversation, a truly interdisciplinary one. Uh, we will open the virtual floor for questions and comments at the very end and keeping in mind the time constraints and all the technical issues, uh, please drop your questions and comments uh, at the very end of the conversation on our Zoom chat box, or you can also leave us a comment in, in our on our Facebook page if you're viewing us live through, through that. Now, without much ado, I'm very excited to introduce to you all our first speaker. Sean Malone is Senior Curator of Pacific Histories and Cultures at Te Papa Tonga Rewa Museum of New Zealand. He specializes in the social and cultural history of Pacific peoples in New Zealand. He's the author of Tatao, A History of Samoan Tatooine, published in 2017 with Sebastian Galliard, and is currently researching issues relating to the agency and activism of Pacific peoples in museums. Sean, the floor is open for you. Thank you very much. And um, talo for love, everybody. I'm Sean Mellon, and it's wonderful to be here sharing um, the Zoom with you all. And I'm um, very, very grateful to be here. And I, I just want to thank the organizers for bringing us together uh, in, in this, um, in these difficult times across great distances and different time zones. So, so thank you very much. Um, I'm Samoan and Irish. I live here in New Zealand and I've been, um, I first started interviewing Samoan tattooists in the late 1990s. And uh, what I'm going to present tonight over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes will be a little bit of background on Samoan tattooing, Samoan tatau, and uh, hopefully I will create some context for um, my friend Dan McTaulapapa McMillan, who will come after me. So I'll just um, move to the screen share so that you can, you can see what I've prepared. Is that coming up, everybody? Yep, okay. So the practices I'm talking about are Samoan tattooing. Now, to, the tattoo in Samoa is called tatau, and the, to, to tattoo people is to um, mark them on the skin with uh, indelible markings. We're all familiar, I guess, with what tattooing is. Um, and these are this slide here is a is just a, an image of some of the tattooing tools that Samoan people use. And while the technology has changed in some ways, Samoan tattooing tools have, have um, stayed the same, the same over, over centuries. Um, the first Samoan people to, uh, the first people to arrive in the Samoan Islands came there around 3000 years ago, and they brought uh, this technology and its associated patterns and designs with them. Or at least they, um, 
least they were uh, introduced um, from other parts of the, the islands in that region around 3000 years ago. So I've just put the selection here so you can see the kind of technology we're talking about. This is not to say that someone tattooing is not done with tattooing machines. Indeed, the most prolific uh, tattoo producers in, in the world for someone tattoos uh, work with machines out of usually tattooing studios. Um, but the the sort of high end of the art, the elitist, the elite end of the art, the real esteemed craftspeople work with these with these tools. I'm just trying to um, get the image to move. Hold on. Here's another set of tools. I'm um, in the past. Uh, before the introduction of um, nylon and plastics, the tools were made from um, turtle shell and um, boar's tusk or human bone sometimes. And um, the bindings were made from coconut fiber. These days, um, because of hygiene concerns, because of the globalization of someone tattooing technology, um, different materials are used that allow the tools to be sterilized and cleaned um, and just allowing people to manage the health and safety, the hygiene concerns around tattooing. So where some more people have gone, the tools have gone with them, but they've changed to meet the needs, the changing circumstances of some more people's lives. Here's a modern um, or contemporary tattooing tool. And you can see that it has soldered needles. Um, oh, sorry, soldered ne needles, a lot more plastic, metal, nylon, and the inks that would have been produced um, from soot in the past and water have been replaced by commercial inks, which also have um, health and safety concerns associated with them. Now you can see that name there, Suluwape Black, uh, the Suluape family is one of several tattooing families that come from two main tattooing lines. There's a third line that has become re-established in recent times, but uh, th through these family lines, the skills of tattooing are passed down from master to apprentice, much like a guild. Um, but uh, the, this is not to say that the practice is not, uh, the, the practice is, is the same. There are um, different schools of thought. There are different ways people practice the art form. And it's a, a very moving and contested um, field of, of production. And this is just the motifs and the, 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 the art form itself. But the, the main um, tattooing markings on um, men and women are fairly stable. Uh, while while saying that it, it, I'm not talking about the individual marks and motifs, they they sort of change and have um, have have become more elaborate over the last two hundred years or so. But um, the most significant markings that you see on someone, men and women, um, for the men usually start around the the waist and around the back and go down to the knees. And um, for women, they're usually done on the thighs. Um, but there are other tattoo markings as well that um, are less important in, in ceremonial and cultural contexts. So here's another image where you can see both the male and female tattoos. So the, the male tattoo is commonly called the pe'a. Um, the female tattoo is called the malu, and together they can be referred in, a, in the polite language of some as malofi. Now, there are other forms of tattooing, as I mentioned. They include taulima, which are armbands, or tavai, which are anklets. And then there's, of course, the full range of you know, popular forms of markings a lot of people make that aren't necessarily tattooing experts. But nonetheless, um, you know, tattooing performs a whole lot of social functions in contemporary Samoan society. But the most important forms are the, are the two that you see on the... the, the the man and woman in this image, those are the two that um, help um, or that guide people in Samoan cultural life and that are most respected and important in Samoan ceremonial 
situations. Look, Samoan tattooing has um, moved, as I said before, we Samoan people have moved. And throughout the world, it has um, also appealed to people who aren't Samoans. And you can see in this photograph here, someone from the Netherlands being tattooed in Samoa, and he's gripping onto the thigh of a Samoan chief, who, as you can see, has European or American motifs on his arms. And he's also tattooed on his back in a manner that expands the, the, the more well-established formats that I showed you in the previous slides. So for me, this image here um, really shows um, Samoan tattooing moving through the world on different people's bodies and people socializing the tatao as a cultural resource. And you can see on the European man's arm there, on his forearm, you can see that those triangular, that triangular motif that, that follows his, goes from his elbow to his wrist. And um, that's not a, a customary Samoan marking. That's a piece that has been done um, especially for him. And in the, in the European tattooing markets and in the convention circuits in, in America as well, um, a lot of people just want to feel what the tools are like. So they will get small pieces done on their arms or legs or backs, slabs, fish, armbands, um, just to, to feel what the tools are like. And I guess in a sense, get a little bit closer to the technologies of, you know, a pre-industrialized past. Um, and it's um, it's continues to be a very sought after experience to be tattooed with some on tools. And perhaps um, one of the big signals of Samoan tattoos globalization is um, took place in 2001 in a village in Samoa that I, I visited and um, as part of a tattooing convention. And these um, six men were given Samoan tattooing chiefly titles. Now, going from left to right, you have a man there that's um, uh, based in Tenerife, you have another one next to him from Hawaii, another one there, number three in the red, he's, um, he's uh, I, I'm not actually sure where he's based, but he's Samoan. Um, the fourth one was based in California, he's passed away now. The fifth man was based in the Netherlands, but, but he doesn't practice tattooing anymore. And the last one is... Um, um, a Maori tattooist based in New Zealand in Aotearoa. And this was a, a significant event that um, was contested and um, caused a little bit of a stir when it happened because it was the gifting of tools and the technology uh, to non Samoan people who are sort of outside the family lines. But through the, the gifting of the tools and especially the titles, they were absorbed into the, the family, they were adopted into the family more formally. In 2017, I, I had the opportunity to, to work with um, four photographers and put together an exhibition uh, based on the research that Sebastian and I had done uh, since the late 1990s on Samoan tattooing. Now we'd produced a book um, just before the exhibition opened and it was a combination of both our work in archives in Europe and um, and interviewing tattooed people and tattoo artists around the world. So this exhibition um, was developed very quickly to take advantage of some of that work. But one of the, th the reason why I want to show the exhibition here just briefly is to show how tattooing has been interpreted many different ways, particularly through the eyes of photographers. Now, this image here is from the main room going into the exhibition and it has historical images um, of someone tattooing by a photographer called Mark Adams, who worked very closely with someone tattooists over 40 years. And he worked with large format cameras and produced these very, very high quality images. So you can see in the background there, right at the back, you can see um, the backside of um, a Dutchman standing in his living room. And he and his wife are tattooed with someone tattoos. But in the foreground here, you can see some images from 1980s New Zealand um, in the living rooms and the contemporary context where Samoan communities had established new community, uh, 
had, with Samoans had established new communities. And on the, and as we go pan across the right of the image, you can see some more, some more shots from that portfolio of Marx. Um, and he maintained very strong relationships and um, gave us a wonderful insider record of um, these families and their work. Another photographer that we featured was Greg Simu. And he's a Samoan photographer now based in Australia, but who's exhibited um, internationally in Europe and, and even um, I think more, most recently in Taiwan. Um, but his journey, like, uh, where Mark's journey was more of a photo documentary approach, um, Greg's was too, but he was documenting his own journey as a tattooed male. So I'm sorry, these images aren't, aren't very um, easy to see, but um, on the left-hand side, you can see self-portraits that he made when he first got his tattoo, his male pair in 1996. And on the opposite wall, you can see three color images where they were taken, I think, in 2014 showing the completion of a band of tattoos across his shoulders, across his back. But his exploration is very personal, um, following the journey of tattoo and how he's used it um, as a set of markings to explore who he was as a Samoan person. In contrast, here's um, an image of Angela Teatia, who's an artist based in Australia, who's also Samoan. This is a self-portrait, a still from a video where she is um, walking up a wall as she lies down on her back. And the, the markings of, of the malu that have been um, presented here and the way Angela is presenting it was confronting for some visitors to the exhibition because the malu is meant to be only shown and even only slightly revealed in certain Samoan ceremonial contexts. But here Angela was challenging the viewer as she walked up the wall repeatedly and um, she was challenging the viewer to ask, well, who controls what the meanings of malu are? Who controls when they are seen? And who controls when they are hidden? Does, it, does that control belong to men? Or does it belong to women who wear the malu? So many visitors who came through, young Samoan men and women, and even non-Samoans, I think a lot of them were confronted and challenged by um, this video installation but it was one of um, the strongest images that we, we perhaps presented in the museum at that time. And in this room, we have um, the work of John Agakuili, who's a Filipino photographer based, uh, Filipino-American photographer based in the States. And he was um, commissioned by the Museum of the Japanese American to, um, work with Samoan tattooists and present a major record of their work. Now, we've picked out of the hundreds of photographs that he took for that project, which was, um, which was uh, presented, I think, around 2016, um, we, we selected this group because it showed the many ways in which tattooing, um, Samoan tattoos, which have a ceremonial context, as I've said, the way in which they can be utilized by individuals to serve a whole lot of purposes. Um, relating to people's personal identities, their identity journeys, similar to Greg's, um, the way they, they connect to an ancestral homeland like Samoa, um, that for, for people who live in LA or Sydney or Auckland or Utah can seem sometimes like a very, very distant place. So Samoa and tattooing, and particularly with the tools, um, can be a way for them to connect uh, spiritually, but also physically, physically uh, to Samoa, its past and its, its, its cultural, its cultural technologies. And um, these images here um, are obviously celebrated in this context, but there are people in the Samoan community who would challenge why the markings may, made for the thighs and the back um, might appear on the arms or in other parts of the body in modified forms. Um, and questions are asked about who, who determines um, or who allows that appropriation to take place, um, who controls Samoan tattooing. But one of the major leaders in the Samoan tattooing community is the um, older gentleman here in the foreground. His name is um, Aleva, Aleva Suluape Patelo. He's the um, 
the sort of senior member of the family. And uh, I think he's been, um, it's been really interesting, his leadership of the family and his accommodation um, and uh, of, of the different ways in which people want to express themselves or, or connect to Samoan culture through Tatao. And here we, this, this image here, taken from Instagram by a guy called Lex55. His name is um, actually Pauletta. Um, this is an image of um, two twins that are co-joined twins that they're joined together. And they they tell the story of the origins of Samoan tattooing, which actually came from Fiji. Now, the short version of the story, and there are many versions of the story, says that the, the, the twins were in Fiji and were given the Samoan tools, were given the tattooing tools, and were instructed to take tattooing and the knowledge of it to Fiji, uh, to, to Samoa. And the, the instructions were tattoo the woman and not the men. And they were, said, you, they were sent on their way. But as they paddled to Samoa or rode or swam, depending on which version of the story you read, they um, saw a clam under the water and they had been repeating to themselves, tattoo the woman and not the men, tattoo the woman and not the men. But when they saw the clam, they were so attracted to it that they swam down to the clam and, and retrieved it. When they came to the surface, they got the song mixed up, the, the instructions mixed up, and it became tattoo the men and not the woman, tattoo the men and not the woman. And this, this was the message that they took with them back to Samoa. And you can see how he has um, created this sort of cartoony anime inspired, animation inspired image um, to illustrate the story of the twins. But here we have um, the Samoan Malu on one of the leading figures of ancient Samoan history and legend. But you notice that on the left hand side, she's wearing the male, uh, the female tattoos, the malu. But on the right hand side, she's wearing the male tattoos, the pea. So this is where I sort of step off a little bit. But I guess there's a point that, because um, I'm going to, it's going to be Dan's opportunity to, to discuss some of, um, of this side of the story. But I guess the big point I wanted to make through my presentation is that. Samoan tattoos have always been a social and cultural resource um, for Samoan people. It's um, helped them transition into different aspects of Samoan social life, from uh, a young person into adulthood, from someone who doesn't serve in a ceremonial context to somebody who does serve the chiefs. But it also, as it's um, become part of uh, the journeys of Samoan people around the globe, it's become a very strong identity marker that in some ways is, un is disconnected from some of its ceremonial meanings and becomes a, a more aesthetic production. And it also is a marker or set of markings that's involved in narratives around gender identities, um, sexuality, uh, the body. Um, and these are very contested identities that um, very few people have actually written about but, has, but they have been explored uh, by artists. And in these examples here that I've pulled from Instagram from the account of Lex55, we get to understand how Samoan tattoo is still part of um, pop culture, social media. And if any of you saw the movie Moana that was put up by Walt Disney a few years ago, you will have seen the, the tattooed figures so we can't retrieve tattoo and Samoan tattooing um, from the media scape, the global media scape, but we can try and understand the way it's put to use in this part of the, the journeys, the narratives and the conversations and the way people construct their, their many identities through these most sacred and ancient marks. So I'll leave it there and um, create some leave, some, leave the space for Dan to pick up this um, narrative and um, his particular explorations. So thank you for listening. I'll just stop you. the screen share. Yeah, thank you so much, Sean, um, for sharing that very deeply contested terrain of Tatao culture, history, and 
also its futures um, within and beyond the Samoan world. And I think you've done a perfect job of setting up the um, scene for Dan to step in. So with that, I'd like to introduce you all to our second speaker for today, uh, Dan T Taula Papa McMullen is an artist and poet from Samoa I Sasai. Their book of poems, Coconut Milk, published in 2013, was on the American Library Association Rainbow List Top 10 Books of the Year. And their artist book on the queer, their story of Polynesia is being published by Paua Honua Society of Honolulu in February 2022 for the Hawaii Triennale. Their work has been shown at the Museum of Contemporary Native Art, Metropolitan Museum, the Young Museum, Musée du Kua, Branley, Auckland Art Gallery, and Bishop Museum. Dan, we're very happy to have you here. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dipti. And uh, thank you, Sean, for um, the invitation to uh, write essays together. Um, I uh, um, hopefully I can add to that uh, very moving and very insightful com conversation or talk that you just gave Sean about the art of to tell. Um, I uh, my work is um, basically in collage of various forms of collage. I'm a poet and a painter. And um, I, uh, if I can show my first image, um, the essay that I wrote uh, with Sean is based on uh, the book that I'm launching here at the Hawaii Trineo, where I am right now. I'm uh, from Samoa Isa'e, which is Eastern Samoa or American Samoa. And Sean is from Samoa Isisifo, which is uh, independent Samoa, Western Samoa. Uh, so we, we come from a kind of divided nation and we're both diasporic in the sense that Sean is in New Zealand and I live in New York. Um, and so our lives are um, impacted by colonialism as our work is. Um, in this work that I'm uh, presenting here in Hawaii right now, and that is also, uh, it's from this work that I um, uh, drew on in uh, working on, uh, in responding to, to Sean's um, essay on Tao, on the art of Tattoo. Um, um, this work is a, a, what, what I call a queer history of Polynesia. Um, some, uh, some of you may be familiar with the word mahu, uh, which is um, a word uh, used here in Hawaii and in Tahiti, um, which uh, stands for a third gender, I suppose, I, or uh, in the middle. It's generally translated as being in the middle or sort of two-spirit. Um, but the origin of the word mahu is um, the word wound. And it relates to the art of healing, which was um, a practice of um, that was often um, delegated to people who lived a, a, a life between the genders. And um, it related to the old religion before Christianity. And so I call this book, The Healer's Wound, although I'm referring also to um, the arrival of westernization um, the uh, devastation of Western diseases where uh, uh, up to 90% of the people in the Pacific Islands uh, died uh, due to Western diseases, um, which um, contributed to the rapid colonization of the Pacific Islands and also to the um, change of religion, uh, which was uh, led from polytheistic religion to a monotheistic religion uh, that was supported by um, the gunboats that the Europeans brought into the situation and the bombing of many villages in the Pacific Islands, and um, the, which solidified the 
the change of religion. In Samoa, um, in, the, in, in this image, um, the queer history of Polynesia, the queer history of Samoa, um, there's very little that I could find in the archives to, to write a history of Samoa. So I thought I would, I would um, make a book that consists of col collaged texts and collaged images uh, from throughout Polynesia since our history is, is so strongly connected and our languages are so strongly connected as a way of uh, sort of figuring out um, this el elided history of Samoa and of Polynesia the, within the, the shared histories of Hawaii, of Tahiti, of Tonga, Samoa, uh, Viti or Fiji, um, the Cook Islands, Rapa Nui or Easter Island, all these connected Polynesian, what we call Polynesian cultures. Um, in the cover, this is the cover to the book. Um, I utilized in a photograph that's from the British Museum um, and is not identified as a transgender image. Uh, so uh, as most of the images I, I utilize in the book and quite often the texts are not, they're certainly not called queer. Queer is not a Polynesian word. Neither is Polynesia. Polynesia is not a Polynesian word. <laughs> Polynesian is not a Polynesian word. We're, we're speaking English here. And um, so I, in some cases, I, I didn't translate the text that I utilized um, because the English translations took them, the text so far away from their meaning. So I simply left them in various languages. Um, but a lot of them did have English translations. Or, and a lot of the, the texts I, I utilized were recorded by missionaries in English and not in Samoan. Or, um, so uh, this was interesting as well. Um, if we could go to the second image. Um, I just have three images. Um, in this image, um, in Samoa, um, the important relationship is what we call the finganga, or the contract. And the contract is between um, brother and sister, um, which is um, the strongest relationship in Polynesian culture, and certainly in Samoan culture. It's even stronger than the relationship between a married man and a married woman, um, because it um, determines um, certain sacred values. It determines um, the passing down of communal lands. Um, it, de uh, it determines a certain uh, power structure. And um, uh, if I can give, for instance, my father once told me that when he um, uh, when he was young and World War II started, he was a teenager. Um, the women in Samoa um, didn't didn't cover their breasts. They still did not cover their breasts in the 1940s. Um, it's just our culture, and and it's the tropics. It's hot, and um, it, um, in the culture, um, this is not a sexual invitation. Um, there is a respect value. Um, a brother never touches his sister's things, let alone her her, her person. He, um, this was uh, our culture. Um, he he wouldn't uh, enter her space. They had separate houses. Um, uh, so um, when the Americans came um, and they outnumbered uh, Samoans two or three to one, they leveled the landscape and although Samoa was not um, part of uh, a field of battle, it was a training ground and a, and a hospital ground. My father worked as a radio uh, technician and my mother worked as a nurse. Um, but because of the behavior of Americans, 
considering this as a sexual invitation, the way women were dressed, they had a they had a created law where women had to cover themselves. Although when I was a child in Samoa in the '60s, within our village, all the women in the city uh, dressed completely in a Western fashion, or mostly within our village, um, it was still uh, okay for women to dress in a similar manner to as you, as you see in this photograph. Although this photograph is from the turn of the century and um, I colorized it and tried to make it a little bit more present. Um, in the, um, in Samoa, uh, I'm considered fafine, fafafine. Fafine meaning woman and fa meaning the way of. Um, although I'm present as maybe non-binary, not necessarily, I'm not as transgender, but within the Samoan community, it's the uh, male to female transgender community that is the center of the queer community in Samoa. And so I'm considered part of that community when I'm in Samoa. Um, and that's the center of the queer community in Samoa. And that's uh, generally how our culture um, identifies queerness is fafafine or fat, what we used to call fatane, which means the way of a man or a woman who lives the way of a man. Um, the, uh, in this um, relationship, in the Fenganga, um, uh, there's a ceremonial position of the taupo. Um, and in war, um, the taupo often led or usually led in, in the processions of war, as you see here. Um, the young woman in the front is uh, the taupo, and there's, I think there's another taupo to the left, and uh, she holds a war club in her, in her hands. And in a way, she represents um, Nafanua. Um, if we could go back to the previous image, please. Um, and in a way, she represents Nafanua. Um, oh, well, we can stay here. Okay, yeah. In a way, she represents Nafanua, who, in the story that Sean mentioned, uh, there are two sisters, uh, Tifanga and Taima, who uh, went to Fiji and they brought the art of Titao to Samoa. And, um, um, but before they went to Fiji to bring the art of the Tao. They uh, were warriors in Samoa and they fought as women in, in the earliest version of the story I, I could find, which is from Manua, which is where my family's from, uh, which is now part of American Samoa. Um, they, um, um, in the narrative, these two young women um, engaged in war and um, they killed men. And um, they uh, were um, considered uh, exemplary warriors within the culture. And, um, but they had conflicts um, with this art that they had discovered in this, in this narrative. And uh, Tila Fainga, you might say Tila Fainga in a way is the one on the right holding the war club. Um, and Taima could be the one on the left in, you know, if I was to put that narrative onto this photograph. And uh, Tila Fainga, uh, you might say was the more warlike one. And this, this practice of war was actually a practice of war and peace. And it's also the foundation of our chiefly culture, the Fatmatai we call. And the Fatmatai or the politics of Samoa, which uh, governs the use of communal lands uh, or communal properties, which is still um, the system of land ownership in Samoa, in both American Samoa and in independent Samoa, um, is uh, connected to this chiefly system, the Fatmatai. And it was Tila uh, Fainga, or the name that she took on later, Nafnua, 
who is considered the founder of this system of, of uh, chiefly rule um, and who developed the protocols of this system. Um, so uh, being in conflict about how they felt about the art of war, they left Samoa and they went to Fiji and there they discovered the art of tattoo or tattooing and they brought that back to Samoa. And when they returned to Samoa, um, there was a group of women they encountered in Savai'i who were being oppressed by a uh, neighboring group of people. And they fought for these, this group of women. And um, again, they uh, uh, conquered the field. And uh, Tila Fainga, and, and in my version of the story, you might say, she might be the, the young woman on the right. Tila Fainga uh, changed her name to Nafunua, which means hidden in the land, and had to do with um, the family of the, the young woman that they were defending. And, um, but after this, the two sisters parted ways. Um, in this early, earliest version of the story that I could find, which is from Manua, which is the last polytheistic uh, culture of Samoa and the last area of Samoa to become Christianized. And so I consider this the more original of the two versions that uh, I see as the two versions of the story. And this is the, the version of the story that really is no longer told in Samoa. And, and so when the two sisters parted ways and when Nafanua, um, the one on the right, uh, took up the, continued to take up the art of war, of war and peace, you might say, and of the chiefly system, uh, she asked her sister to, to take up the art of tattoo. And she, she said, um, we have different roads and we're gonna part ways. And uh, it's for you to take up the art of tattooing and for me to take up the art of war. And um, that, was, um, that was their goodbyes. And they um, went to different islands. So I'll go to the next slide, please. And uh, um, now in a subsequent version of the story, um, which I traced to actually the early 1900s, um, Nafanua, when she fought, disguised herself as a man. And I think that's a very curious version of the story because, um, and, I, and I can't trace it before say 1900, whereas the, the other version I, I trace is being a truly pre-Christian story. Um, but in the, you might call it the Christian version of the story, it's, um, and I, I believe it's influenced by the transgender culture of Samoa, she uh, covers her breasts and she disguises herself as a man. But the version of the story, um, I think, is dependent on a Western concept of what it is to be a man and a Western concept of what it is to be a woman. Um, so that's just my interpretation. And um, in um, as uh, rifles were brought by the Westerners and sold to Samoans, and uh, as um, the Europeans uh, arrived in Samoa and different chiefs allied, uh, one chief would ally or, or a king would ally to um, the British, another to the French, another to the Americans. Um, and uh, the culture changed. The Taupo um, now covered themselves and they tended to carry water. They, they, were, they were no longer carrying weapons. Um, they're uh, still sort of leading, but they were not leading as warriors in the ceremonial aspect. They were leading as water bearers. And um, I see that as a sort of uh, the influence of 
westernization um, ideas of gender. And um, these ideas were carried further um, through uh, and uh, uh, influenced also the way we see what we call queer cultures um, in Samoa and the um, oppression of, of our suppression of the queer cultures, certainly in the cities in Samoa, in Pongo Pongo, in American Samoa, and in Apia, where it was no longer allowed for um, men to uh, live as women. And then in the 1900s, they were arrested for dressing as women in the city, although in the villages, um, it was perfectly fine for uh, someone who was born as a male to dress as a woman in, in church. And, and that, but then, then in the 60s, it changed again and uh, returned to a more traditional way and um, with a sort of, with the independence of uh, Western Samoa and it became an independent nation. And, um, and now um, both American Samoa and independent Samoa uh, have very uh, strong traditions that continue of fafafinga, transgender, and fatami, or um, male to female and female to male uh, transgender cultures and we're a little bit closer to uh, the cultures that uh, were, were originally had, although uh, things are always in the process of change. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you so much, Dan, um, for sharing these collage of images with us and also this sort of really interesting history of um, just the imposition of colonization on Samoan culture and queer culture as well. So um, I found that very um, moving. Um, and maybe that's a segue into our third speaker. Um, so our final speaker for today's conversation is Kumud Rana. Uh, she is an academic researcher in gender and sexuality and has a background in feminist, queer and critical development studies. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Zurich in the Department of Social Anthropology and Cultural Histories. So uh, Kumud, uh, I would like to open the floor for you and um, this will be the last, uh, you will be the last speaker for today's conversation. Thank you. Uh, just going to put on my headphones. Um, can I can I have the presentation up, please, Vishalji? Thank you. Um, I just want to start by thanking the Kathmandu Triennale team for inviting me to be part of this book project and giving me the space to think through these issues that have become so close to my understanding of myself and what's going on in Nepal, issues that I've talked about with friends in Nepal and outside, and especially with friends within Chaukot, which is a feminist collective in Nepal. So for the presentation today, I draw from my four year PhD study on the LGBTI movement in Nepal um, and the important role collective identities like LGBTI or third gender have played in mobilizing people towards creating a social movement and in articulating common grievances. Um, but today, I I take a different approach than I did previously in trying to grapple with what it might mean to think decolonially about queerness and indigeneity in the Nepali context. Not just thinking, but also being, doing, living in between the cracks of what we might understand as queer and indigenous. I'll first draw from conceptualizations of some key terms, mainly what I mean by decoloniality, queer and indigenous, before moving on um, to what I've been thinking in terms of the indigenous queer and the queerly indigenous within Nepal's sociopolitical context. I'll then briefly talk about the Chumra dance, a dance form performed by men dressed as women from the Tharu community, as one example of how modernity and coloniality operate to marginalize the indigenous and the queer. 
Um, the next slide, please. Okay, yeah. I take the conceptualization of decoloniality as explained by Walter Mignolo and Catherine Walsh, two decolonial thinkers from the Latin American context, where they write, and I quote, that coloniality is constitutive and not derivative of modernity. That is to say, there is no modernity without coloniality, and thus the compound expression, modernity slash coloniality. So they write, for us, the horizon is not the political independence of nation states as it was for decolonization, nor is it only or primarily the confrontation with capitalism and the West. Our interest and concern reflected in this book, but also in the conversation sustained since the late 1990s within what has been referred to as the modernity decoloniality shared project are with the habits that modernity coloniality implanted in all of us, with how modernity coloniality has worked and continues to work to negate, disavow, distort, and deny knowledges, subjectivities, world senses, and life visions. And this is what um, the presenters before me also so beautifully expressed in their presentation. So it is more about seeing two sides of the story simultaneously, that is modernity coloniality, instead of only seeing one side at a time. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, so in their book, the authors talk about modernity being known by different names in different time periods and locations like the Renaissance, progress, the civilizing mission, or more recently, development and growth. To be modern is to be of the present, but more specifically, the present of Europe. So modernity is seen as being in contradistinction with tradition. To be modern is to let go of tradition. But Mignolo and Walsh argue that modernity and tradition are instead two modern concepts and I will come back to this later to show how they actually coexist. But in this process, the ancients are also created as um, being behind, backward, and conservative, which I will talk more about when I talk about the Chumra dance. Now to go to the next slide, um, in terms of conceptualizing the terms queer and indigenous, uh, due to the diversity of terms used and the varied understandings of the same term by different individuals, it is difficult to find a single uncontested term without getting lost in the nuances of each when we talk about queer. So I use queer to loosely refer to non-heteronormative and non-cisnormative subjectivities and not necessarily consciously chosen identities that pertain to gender identity and or sexual orientation whether or not the term is used by any of the people included in my study. I understand identity terms to be always contextual, always contested and always evolving. But when referring to specific individuals, I would make it a point to use the labels they self-identify with, whether or not those labels are deemed politically correct or incorrect by others. The respectability assigned to any term changes with time and context, and new terms will likely continue to come into use, while the old ones we use now might be inter interpreted differently or be redundant and lost. But I also see the um, meaning of queer as, I also take the meaning of queer as strange or the other, especially when talking about indigenous people. Um, and, and now to move on to the term indigenous, um, the understanding of indigenous is um, about being born or engendered in or native to a land um, or relating to the native inhabitants of a land. But I would also want to be careful about the insistence on land, drawing from black critique of indigenous activist discourses in the US or Canada, for instance where the claims to land and territory might further exclude those already disenfranchised, enslaved, or those who have never had access to land, property, and territory in the first place. We might think of this in the context of Dalit people in Nepal and South Asia, for instance. But there's a second important thing to draw from Dalit scholarship and activism against caste, which has important lessons for ethnic activism and discourses around indigeneity in Nepal as well. <clears throat> 
Sharmila Rege, in her book, Writing Caste, Writing Gender, writes about Dalit feminist critiques in the early 1990s of the conceptions of genderless caste and casteless gender. Rege argues that gender is in fact central to the construction of caste and caste purity. That is, caste purity depends on the supposed purity of women and whom she bears children with because this would determine whether or not those offsprings are legitimate, authentic members of that specific group. Dalit feminist thinkers like Savitri Bai Fule have ar argued um, how the practice of endogamy or marriage within the group is an attempt to regulate the purity of that group and that this purity cannot be maintained without regulating who women have sex with, love or marry. For the purpose of this presentation, I would ask that we bear in mind that the caste structure cannot be maintained without an active enforcement of that system. Uh, but perhaps, um, but that perhaps many indigenous groups might also not exist without similar forms of control of women's sexuality. Now to go to the next slide. Um, I make a distinction between cosmopolitan, Anglo-American or global categories, categories that are seen as more global. Um, and then I move on to the vernacular categories. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that the cosmopolitan categories allows for different kinds of possibilities of being and living, and that they have been important for activism, especially when used as collective identities um, for the purpose of social movement mobilization. But then there's also either an implicit or an explicit association of these categories with being modern and progressive. By this, I don't mean to imply that it is easy to be queer in Nepal if one identifies with one of the globally recognized categories, as Niranjan Kumar's memoir also clearly shows, but rather to emphasize that respectability can be gained in some ways through the social and economic capital we have access to and through the cosmopolitan lives we either live or aspire to live. Now to go to the next slide on the indigenous queer. The mainstream LGBT movement in Nepal has simultaneously pushed for the legal and social recognition of both the Anglo-American categories and what is emerging as a South Asian category of the third gender, uh, which is a more expansive category. Many of the participants in my um, larger, broader study, as well as a significant proportion of participants um, in a survey with over 1,000 LGBTI people in Nepal, conducted by the Williams Institute and the UNDP in 2014, came from Janjati or indigenous groups in Nepal. And yet we have a third gender category, mainly fashioned around Hindu myths of gender crossing gods, while other vernacular categories have been subsumed, subsumed under it without much engagement. For example, Meiti was among the various categories used in Nepal by those assigned male at birth to signal a feminine gender presentation and sexual desire for other men. The Meiti category is often evoked alongside other cultural categories like Notua or Hijra, which together make up the third gender category. Many of the Kathmandu-based um, activists who had previously identified as Meiti do not do so anymore. They instead identified as transgender or Thessalingi during interviews for my study, which was uh, between 2016 and 2018. There was a stigma associated with the Meiti identity, with activists often describing it as something undesirable, something of the past. With little opportunities for employment elsewhere, working class Metis in the capital city often engaged in transactional sex and were easily identified by the police owing to the gender nonconformity. Many of the people who identified with vernacular categories like Meiti also come from marginalized ethnic and class backgrounds do not speak English and often live in the margins of the capital city or the smaller towns and cities of Nepal. So what we're talking about is not just the indigenous queers, but also perhaps the queerly indigenous, which I talk about in the next slide. The queerly indigenous or the strange other, 
In her book, Pahichan Kukhoji on Indigenous Women's Search for the Identity in Nepal, Kailas Rai writes about how past writings on indigenous women by mostly upper caste men in Nepal have constructed an image of them as uneducated and highly sexualized. Dominant Hindu upper caste values around female chastity and monogamy were projected onto indigenous women as licentious and uncivilized when they deviated from these norms. As Sira Tamang also notes, the Muluki Ayn or the Civil Code of 1854 regulates sexual intercourse with women from higher caste groups while assigning lower caste and indigenous women as bhogya or someone open for public consumption. The over-sexualization of indigenous women went hand in hand with the emasculation of indigenous men. The Tharus, for instance, were often described by upper caste urban authors from both Brahmin Chhetri and Newa groups, two groups among others that benefited from the displacement of the Tharus from their land. So they described the Tharus as primitive, simple-minded, obstinate, and ignorant. But indigenous groups like the Limbus also led major rebellions and resistance movements during the years of the Shah monarchy, the Hindu Shah monarchy, which were quelled by the increasing military and economic power of the Nepali state. Claims to ethnic identity and resistance to Hinduism were interpreted by the Nepali state as political subversion and dissidents were harassed, prosecuted or jailed. Falgunanda was one such rebel. There is very little on the Mahaguru, but from my conversation with Professor Martin Gainsley, who has worked extensively on the Kirati communities in Nepal, Falgunanda was a bit of a queer character. Although Professor Gainsley doesn't use the term queer to describe Falgunanda, I take the liberty to do so in the sense that I use queer to signify something not normative. As you can see in the picture uh, to the right here, which is one of only two pictures of the Mahaguru. Falgunanda is decked in jewelries traditionally worn by Kirati women, especially married Kirati women. And it is said that he presented himself as a bride to, of the main divinity, Dagera, and that many Limbus saw him as not male. According to Professor Gainsley, one eyewitness described him as soft-spoken and kind, but also eccentric. There are no known records of his relationship to any woman, and he has been seen as a solitary figure whose followers were mostly men. His ambivalent character is said to have been a part of his charisma, especially among the highly masculinized military image of Kirati men as warriors who fought against the Saha rulers. Of course, anthropologists and historians, among others, caution us against using our current or modern conception of gender to read someone as queer from the past. But then again, trans and queer historians might argue that this resistance to a queer reading of clearly non-normative figures or practices could also partly come from straight and or cisgender people invested, whether consciously or unconsciously, in seeing a more rigid gender binary. Um, I will now turn to the Jhumra Nat in the next slide, a cultural dance within the Tharu community in Nepal performed by men who dress up in women's clothes and jewelries. This dance might be performed during important ceremonies within the community. The Natua or people who perform this dance and with whom I talked to explained that they had always wanted to wear their sister's or mother's clothes as a young child and that dancing as a profession appealed to them because it allowed them to dress up even as adult men. While we might be tempted to read this as a trans experience, all the Natuas I spoke to did not identify as trans and were also married to women, had children with them, and took pride in being able to look after their families as other men in their communities do. Some of them might have sexual relations with other men while others do not. Some of them might dress up in a more feminine manner in everyday life beyond the performances. Um, and as one of them said, walk, walk with a lochak or a sway, while others would never do so. Some of them might have their noses pierced to put on the nose pin worn by, usually worn by women. And once they do so, they might not be allowed to perform certain rituals usually performed by men. But to go back to the dance, what stood 
stood out to me is the conversations I had with one of the dancers I spoke to who made a distinction between Purano or old Tumra Nat and modern or new Tumra Nat. It is an interesting distinction since the Purano Tumra used to be performed only by men with distinctive steps and songs that were sung with a passion that cannot be found in what he calls the modern Tumra, which I will turn to later. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So there are some Jumra dancers who are trying hard to preserve the old dance form, even when young men are increasingly averse to joining such a group. Older men continue to dance the past or the traditional in the present or contemporary times. So the old Jumra actually cannot be of the past since it is also danced in some places in the present context. This takes us back to Mignola and Walsh's earlier point about how modernity and tradition are two modern concepts that coexist. And that in order for modernity to manage, to maintain an image of progressiveness, it needs the traditional to contrast itself against as regressive. Can you have the next slide, please? If to be modern is to be of the present, then this process of being in the present or being modern began in the past, more specifically in Bikram Samvat 2046 or 2047, which is between the year 1990 and 1991 in the Gregorian calendar. It was during this time that women started dancing the Tumra dance, at least in the context of Dang and the Okuri in Nepal. The dancer I referred to earlier talked about specific moments he remembered as being pivotal in bringing about this change. He talks about his group being invited to perform at a cultural event in the Surkhet Darbar or Surkhet Palace in honor of the royal family from Kathmandu and how the then Queen Aishwarya did not approve of men dressing up as women and performing this dance. So she asked the group if women could do the dance instead, especially if the song was supposedly be, to be sung by a woman. And he says that the queen did not really think it was appropriate. It was that it did not really look nice for the men to be dancing as women. So the dancer whom I could maybe call Chaudhari Ji explained that in order to make the dance better or more appealing, especially to those outside his own community, he started including both men and women in the Chumra Nats and made it more modern, that is fitting with the present times. This trend of having both men and women play the normative gender roles in both the songs sung subsequently and the dance performed thereon was even more entrenched during the Tharu Nach Mahotsav in Chitwan in the following year. Chaudhari Ji complained of women not being able to do the dance properly because the old steps required a lot of physical energy and the old dance form required dancers to dance for long hours but also that the young girls he was able to hire into his group did not always take the dance seriously. But then again, he also felt the pressure of modernizing the dance, as he says. This modern iteration, brought about partly by the intervention of a Hindu queen, entrenched in her role as a necessary consort of the king, responsible for bearing him successors of the purest breed and embedded in a political, social, and economic structure that required the reinforcement of a strict gender binary and clearly defined gender norms. But this change was also brought about by the modernization of various art forms, more specifically songs being recorded in studios with men singing their lines and women singing theirs, dances performed for dignitaries and tourists in cultural events or tourist resorts, showcasing a modern but still traditional Nepal. So to conclude, all of this not only shows how the traditional is constructed as something belonging to the past for the modern to exist, but also how some gender norms might be made more rigid in this process of modernization. That's all, thank you. Um, thank you so much for that very, very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I definitely see a lot of resonances in what you've shared, especially uh, with the provocation of trying to look at modernity alongside colonization and coloniality. And so with the other two speakers, um, thank you again to all our speakers.
Eagles for uh, generously sharing your research, uh, artistic and curatorial practices as well. Uh, I, I hope uh, the audience um, has had some time to think about and maybe perhaps also have questions for you all. So I'd like to open the floor for any comments or questions from the audience. Um, and also if the speakers have any uh, comments or responses to each other's presentations to feel free to do so as well. Uh, you can raise your hand or drop the comment and feedback or questions in the chat box as well. Maybe I would also like to request the speakers to um, turn their cameras on or um, if, if they're comfortable doing that. So there is a question from Nirandan Kaur. Um, this is for Dan. I was curious to hear a little more about how Samoan culture discusses queerness, if there are such categories, etc. Uh, Dan? Uh, there are two main organizations, one in independent Samoa, the Samoan Fafafine organization, and um, Sophia in American Samoa or Samoa Isisa'e, Eastern Samoa. And um, neither one of them uh, sort of officially um, promotes the word gay or queer. Um, they um, uh, prefer Samoan terms and um, most of the members are predominantly someone speaking. And so those are not even words in the someone language. Um, so um, it's an odd thing that uh, the Fafafingi community doesn't necessarily support marriage equality. Um, or queer marriage officially um, uh, because of the respect system between men, women, and Fafafinge, that um, marriage is considered in the Fafafinge community as something between men and women, and not necessarily between men and Fafafinge or women and Fatane, although as in any place in the world, everyone lives their own life and we all negotiate our own spaces um, between what we call westernization, which is actually a global culture that is no longer Western, but we still call it Western, um, but it's the culture that belongs to the entire world um, and to nobody. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that would be my answer to that question. Um, I felt like I'm leaving something out, but that would be the, my basic answer. Thank you so much, Shan. Um, we also have a comment from Vishal, who is part of the um, Triennale team. Thank you so much for your time. Presentations were really insightful to all the speakers. Um, yeah, so feel free to drop in any comment or questions if you have any. Meanwhile, I was also, I have a couple of questions that I'm just thinking through, but maybe this is something that we all can um, um, also think through together here as we're all already here in this space. Um, uh, 
maybe um, I can start with Dan because I thought what you shared at the very beginning, this sort of struggle to find things in the archive really, uh, it resonated with um, some of the struggles that as a researcher I have as well. But, uh, and then I don't know if I understood it properly, but your suggestion that collages of images can, uh, or by collaging images, uh, it can also offer an alternative to an archive or like a counter reading of an archive. Um, so I wanted uh, you to maybe speak a little bit more about your own um, process of looking at archival images and how you work through that in your own artistic practices. Um, if you could just share a little bit on that. I think there's a, um, I won't say a mythology, but there's a belief system that indigenous cultures are are as oral as they've always been. And um, in my search, re research to the archives, I find that this, the narratives of Polynesia changed over time. And when uh, a certain narrative was recorded and published or written down, um, it, it can only reflect that moment that it was written down. And um, so then it becomes a search for when was it written down and what was that moment and how did it relate to other moments? And um, uh, for instance, in my, in my book, um, I utilize images and um, I, I colorize a lot of images and I put them every which way. I sometimes click collide or um, uh, a lot of them I put upside down and um, I have them going every which way but in a way it's kind of a code because uh, if I think that a particular text is actually completely western and um, uh, for, for instance a, a translation of the bible into someone um, that might uh, substitute something that a word in the King James Version that might use the word abomination, but there's a search for corresponding word in Maori or Hawaiian or Tahitian or Samoan, and there are always different words or a word for a man who lives as a woman. And how is that word? Interesting enough, interestingly enough, the word fafafine, which I source as the oldest word in Polynesia for transgender cultures, is not in the Samoan Bible. And I suspect it was part of a certain respect system that because the Bible condemned transgenderism, that the Samoans who were ultimately the people who translated the Bible working with English speaking missionaries, um, that they avoided that word. That's my theory, that's my pet theory. I don't know if it's true or not, it's just my guess. Um, and I forget what the question was, but... <laughs> I'm sorry, what was the question? No, that's okay. Um, I was just hoping to learn a little bit more about how you work with archives and, and perhaps- Yeah, well, um, also it's funny, we talk about artificial intelligence, how, how it's used in different ways. And Elon Musk is warning the whole world that uh, artificial intelligence is the most dangerous thing on the planet. And maybe it is true, um, but uh, everything that's been published almost everything that's been published is, is and we can use Google, uh, search engines to, but you know, you, you, in a way you do kind of rely on oral culture because it's from my experiences growing up someone um, and speaking someone as a child, although I'm not fluent now, but um, I certainly read someone and I've made a practice of reading in various languages, colonial and indigenous languages of the Pacific. Um, it's possible to source information, but then one relies on one's life experiences to, to lead that search. And uh, so in that sense, I, I collage, but my decisions about what to collage in text and image and how to collage is informed by life, um, by my sexuality and my relationship to gender. Uh, 
and um, my experiences within a community that has, um, I think, a rather unique viewpoint and a community that is not separate from an overall community. You can't say that someone Fafi community is separate from someone community, it's not. Someone's Fafi is don't consider ourselves separate from the Samoan community. We, 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 our category, our social category is inseparable from our community, our culture. And, um, and I think that's true for Hawaiians from Hawaiian Mahu and Mahu and Tahiti and the Fakaliti in Tonga and uh, Fakasa Lewa Lewa in, in Fiji and uh, Whakawahine and Taktapui in Aotearoa or New Zealand. It's, uh, it's impossible to separate what we call our queerness from our overall culture. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. I, I think we have a question here in the chat for Sean. Uh, by Apurva Raj, uh, you touched on the increasing use of indigenous sacred or ritual visual symbols in popular media. Would you or the other speakers have further thoughts on how the vastness and accessibility, the platform that social media provides today can perhaps encourage better understanding or more opportunities for diverse voices to be heard? Has heritage in the continuation of ancestral knowledge, activism and advocacy been reinvigorated in any way? Uh, bracket disregarding the perils of social media and Disney for a moment. So this question is actually for all of you, but maybe we can begin with Sean. Thank you for the question. Um, and I think um, your last couple of lines are really interesting. Dis disregarding the perils of social media and um, Disney for a moment. I mean, um, it's so hard and so difficult to retrieve some of the knowledge related to Samoan tattoo from this global media scape that we are all part of. But um, so, you know, I, 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 th I think if there's one thing the archive has taught me about Samoan tattooing in my scouring in recent, in, in recent years of the social media archive and just talking to Samoan people in person, and the producers of Samoan tattooing, one thing I've come to realize is just, it's a contested practice, you know, and it, it's never really been fixed in time in any one moment. And um, people people are invested in preserving the idea that Samoan tattoo has been presented through time un, unchanged, unchanged and from generation to generation as if it's some holy thing. But it, it's actually, the history of tattoo shows you that it has been changed by Samoan people as much as by people nowadays around the world. So um, one of the observations I made about the social media scape is the way in which um, uh, difficult questions about like, like this question, a question like this question might be used as clickbait because people know it's so controversial and there'll be so many people who will comment and fight over it. And it becomes one of those long threads that everybody sits back and eats the popcorn because there's this fighting and, and uh, dis disagreement. So, you know, when people ask me about this kind of thing and how to deal with Tatao and its appropriation for the purposes of Disney or commercial use or um, when it's on the bodies of sports people on, on television, I try, I mean, but the only thing I can say is that what, what people should focus on if they're worried about losing it to the outside world is on keeping intact those social and cultural contexts that have the most meaning for Samoan people. If you can preserve those contexts for Tatao, you have some control over it. But keeping in mind at the same time that even those contexts are subject to change depending on which country they are in, which context, which city, which community, which village. So look after those contexts with Samoan Tatao has the most meaning because you can't retrieve it from everywhere else. So that's that's sort of where I land on it. But it's that's what makes it such an interesting um, 
phenomena to study it. For me, it's not really about the meaning of your remark, but more about how people put it to use and act upon it in their everyday lives. That's what makes it interesting for me. Thank you, Sean. Any of the other two speakers would like to add to that, please feel free to do so. I could add something. Um, I mean, yes, of course, social media has been crucial for connecting with other people like oneself and in creating communities. And part of this community building happens with articulation of common identities. Um, so definitely social media would play a big role um, in that sense. But also traditionally, we don't really have um, such identities or communities that I talked about in the presentation for those assigned female at birth, not just in Nepal, but in many parts of the world, many other parts of the world as well. So to be articulating and even creating identities, creating new identities that then build communities um, is something that we are seeing more of. Uh, it's something that is made possible through social media as well. Um, but then social media and what we call the globalization of queer identities also have its limitations in terms of um, in terms of like uh, othering uh, the marginalized within the queer communities as well. Um, but yeah, but um, the point that I'm trying to make is that um, in the presentation also is about how the different movements should be in conversation with each other, the feminist, the queer, the indigenous, the Dalit, um, movements of the marginalized, if we can be in conversation with each other, maybe we can have more productive discourses. Um, raise their hand. So if you had a, if you had something to ask or comment on. Um, um. Hi, Sin, Dan, Kumu, thank you for your sharings, insightful sharings. Um, so I was sort of wondering, because I'm also part of a collective at Nepal through which we're doing this, trying to understand uh, the Thedana, Godana, Tatu marking um, like practices in the region in Nepal. And primarily, with the um, Tharu indigenous community, and this research is led by Lobkan Saudari, along with Urmila Gamma Tharu. And one of the, Urmila is here uh, in the Zoom. And, and one of the like, challenges we are having is uh, how the marking culture uh, was um, associated with ostracization. Um, and how, and, and through the field works we're having, like one of the uh, last time the artists did their tattoos were like 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, and it was also primarily because like how it was associated with witchcraft, for example, uh, how communities living around the forest, uh, were sort of, yeah, like the, the uh, superstitions, et cetera, but also because the indigenous community were also uh, uh, segregated as Masina Matwali, um, enslavable alcohol drinkers. So there, there are a lot of connotations. Um, so the movement of not doing the marking, Chedna Tika, came also from the uh, community itself as a resistance in a way. Uh, to not be separated from other communities. And as we know, like the, the tattoo culture and Hedana has also a lot of, it's a language of its own, is a, is a connection to the ancestor. It has a, it is a process of healing. It's, it's a matrilineal sort of um, continuity, it's kinship. Um, and by the the, the the Jumra dance, which Kumud shared about, is is from the Tharu community itself. But in this whole process, uh, 
lot of things got lost and and i was wondering like when we when the generation now no more knows about the symbolism uh, which was uh, in the bodies of their grandmothers and mothers and how do we reinterpret it how do we see it how do we understand it when this whole i mean everything is not lost of course but but there are some things which many yeah we don't know about it anymore and then how do we deal with this sort of loss um if, if in your own experiences also yeah if it, that's um i really that story is familiar in the pacific uh, around cultural loss and the um the, the stamping out or the prohibition of tattooing in various island groups and various cultures uh, Samoa was one of the places where despite missionary um, attempts to prohibit it it continued and survived and there was a that was because not all missionaries are the same different denominations had different rules but also it was dependent on the ability of Samoan people to keep persisting and and, and finding a place for someone tattooing despite restrictions by by the church um but these days i think there's still a lot of cultural loss um and the interesting thing that's happening amongst pacific people in new zealand because of the limitations of archives and because of the limitations of cultural knowledge and the living memory of people um people are inventing tattoos that mean something today um so T tattoos that might reference the symbolism of um, their ancestors, but might mean something very different in the in the their contemporary life. One of the a scholar down here in New Zealand who's from Hawaii actually, her name is Emilani Case. She just published a book at the end of last year called "Everything Ancient Was Once New," and I think that sort of unlocks and gives gives a little bit of freedom for our creativity to create something for the now that one day will be ancient. I mean, it's literally, it's pretty straightforward, but I, I really love the way she um, titled her book. And of course she explores that in much more detail in the text. So I think artists can help us heal in that way and bridge the gap between um, the present and the past. And some of the losses we have felt, artists are in a good position to do that. So it's, um, but it, it's the constant challenge and it's about communicating to our communities of interest, finding where the need is. Um, thank, thank you. I actually also wanted to just, just quickly continue what I had abruptly like stopped in the beginning to acknowledge Bhakta Badur Sharki um, and his sculptures and, and the community, uh, Dalit community whose labor and intellectuality were consumed and, and the works they made, sculpture they made were uh, offered on the shrine, shrines, but at the same time they were not allowed to enter in the shrine itself and how the individual and communities who are making it are still marginalized marginalized and ostracized and it's it's not a thing of a past and a continuous process uh, and continuous like reality which is happening still now um thank you so much Shilasha, um and also sean for responding to that um I also had a question for uh, Komoti. Um, so I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on the rejection of queerness from the Kuranas themselves, who believed that they were still, you know, part of a very heteronormative sort of Nepali society, and what implications uh, does this rejection have on your attempt at doing a colonial and queer reading? Of Practice, right? So, as well, if you have any thoughts on that, I'd love to hear. Thank you. I think that's a big question. I don't know if I have an answer to that. 
but when you see the rejection of queerness by the dancers, by the Jumra dancers, or by people using vernacular categories, I think what I'm uh, referring to mainly is not a not exactly a rejection in that sense, but um, but how they feel uncomfortable. Like it is very much a classed thing. How they feel uncomfortable using. English language categories for themselves. For example, I use the category dohori. I mentioned that in the presentation. So there was a man in the in my study who identified as dohori, and he said, "I'm not gay because I cannot be gay because I'm not dressed smartly. I cannot speak English. I'm not stylish, so I cannot be gay. I'm, I'm a dohori. I do both the top and bottom role. Um, so it, it's." It's not so much of a rejection as such, but but just an assertion of who they are and how they don't really fit into um, uh, the Anglo-American categories. But what implications does this rejection of queerness have in terms of um, decolonial thinking about gender and sexuality? Um, I, I don't know. I think I see um, the blurring of lines between heteronormativity and homonormativity or heterosexuality and homosexuality, um, that there can be heterosexuality within homosexual spaces and, and vice versa as well. And that maybe then the problem is that we are putting these labels onto people as them needing to be either heterosexual or homosexual or queer and not queer. Um, so I, I think I see, um, because lives are so much more complicated than the labels themselves, and the labels try to box us into these specific categories and tell us what we should be doing and not doing. But then people have been living their lives that blur the boundaries like since forever. And I think it is the blurring that I'm interested in. But also, like you said, to be more um, critical um, also of you know the gendered and um, sexualized um, uh, like systems of oppression that women, for example, might find themselves in. Um, like do the wives of the Jumra dancers have the same freedom as the men to be with other women? But then I also think like, how, are, how am I thinking of freedom? Do the women really want that freedom? Or do they value something else um, that is not freedom, but that is something else? For example, the Jumra dancers who are all married and who took great pride in being providers for their family, value, value that, you know, value their role as providers for the family instead of their freedom to be openly queer. I mean, that is not something they value at all. And I draw this mainly from Sabah Mahmoud's work on um, the politics of piety within Islam and um, Islamic women taking up the hijab. Um, so yeah, I. I don't know if I answered your question, but these are things that I'm thinking about. Uh, thank you so much. No, you definitely answered my question. And um, again, like, thank you so much to all of our speakers today for taking the time out and sharing your work with us. Uh, we're very, very honored to have you all here. Um, if there are no questions, no further questions, I think we, uh, we are, doing really good with time so we can also close the close the conversation but perhaps uh this just means opening up more conversations in the future um on indigeneity on queerness or queer histories on uh, on our shared histories and shared struggles as well uh to have more transregional conversations in the future so uh, i am definitely really looking really really forward to reading all your pieces in the publication as well so um very excited about that um and yeah so without further ado i would like to announce that the conversation is formally at an end but uh and thank you all the audience as well um you're on zoom and on facebook as well for joining us for another really really intense and uh, insightful set of conversations and thoughts um in Katie Kurakani conversations thank you so much <laughs>